Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Camp Atterbury is now in the rearview mirror for the more than 7,000 Afghan evacuees who were housed there beginning last September. I don't want to talk and think about Camp Atterbury. Yeah. It was a bad experience for my life. We share the story of one Afghan man who was housed at the base and the challenges he'll face starting a life in the U.S. One side effect of the pandemic is more people have been forced into working remotely, and that has community leaders rethinking how they attract employers and employees. There are a lot of Americans, an abundant number of Americans, who want to live in a clean, safe place with decent schools where they can know their neighbors. Indiana ought to be thriving on that. And Bloomington residents can now submit their own plans for traffic calming devices they'd like to see around the city. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Camp Atterbury is no longer housing Afghans who fled the country when the Taliban took over at the end of August. One of a handful of locations across the country assisting in resettlement operations, more than 7,000 people had been temporarily housed at the base. Our reporter Mitch Legan brings us the story of one of the evacuees. I met up for tea with Masood Rayug at his apartment on the south side of Indianapolis. He's one of about 200 people from Camp Atterbury who have settled here in Indiana. He's been here for just about two weeks, not too far from his sister and brother-in-law. It's different from what they were used to in Afghanistan. We are living uh, in, a, in a beautiful house in Afghanistan that they are living. My father, my parents, my brother. I have two brothers and a three sister. But he says it beats the situation at Camp Atterbury. Wayog had worked for the government in Afghanistan and left soon after the Taliban's takeover. For eight nights, I didn't sleep in my own house. Yeah, I went to my friend's house in different locations because um, Taliban, some of Taliban that they know as. He left his car on the side of the road in Kabul and boarded a plane with nothing but his passport and the clothes he was wearing. His parents, wife and daughter are still there. He doesn't know if he'll see them again. Mm, I know that uh, he is spending so bad times for now. Sometimes every day, maybe every day I'm uh, calling to her and we are talking together. He spends his days with the family he has here, chatting, trying new foods, and waiting for work documents. He's eager to leave the last six months behind him. I don't want to talk and think about Camp Atterbury. Yeah. It was a bad experience for my life. Wayug was one of the first people to arrive at the camp and one of the last to leave. He spent four and a half months in a barracks, sleeping on bunk beds with about 30 other men. They passed the time taking walks, playing cards, and praying. <laughs> What really bothered him was the constant waiting. Having no control over what would happen to him or his family affected his mental health. It, it was like a, 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 a dark uh, home and uh, your eyes are closed and you can't do anything for, for yourself. Yeah, it was a big pressure on that time, yeah. He had a lot of time to think about his decision to leave Afghanistan. It was the safest move for his family, even if they weren't able to make it over. But he worries for them now. Because I have nothing. I have to left everything in Afghanistan. Yeah, it was a, a it was a big decision, and I think that was so big pressure. Wayug studied the culture and practiced English for distraction. He wanted to set himself up for success. 
The next few months will be crucial for evacuees and the organizations that support them. They need to learn the culture and language and connect with employment. But the most important assistance could be psychological, not economic. The second wave of effort comes after the 90-day mark when they, have, they need to start um, providing counseling and psychological services to people who've experienced unbelievable violence. Weyug has a degree in economics and a master's in public administration. He's already reached out to professors about continuing his education and would like to become a teacher. For many Afghan evacuees, the, one of the keys is going to be recertifying in their professions. And that is not something that is easy to do in the United States. Higher qualified evacuees will likely have to work lower wage jobs at first, and Weyug's fine with that. He'll work for the next two years before he applies for asylum. He knows his future is uncertain, but he's more concerned for his family. He's hoping one day they'll be able to reconnect. But for now, he's focused on improving his life here. I, I thought that I'm here uh, and uh, my future also uh, will be good. But some people are in Afghanistan. They have no future. Let's uh, accept this situation. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. In all, the United States has evacuated more than 75,000 Afghans since the country fell through Operation Allies Welcome. Now, we're joined by Indiana Public Broadcasting State House reporter Brandon Smith. Hello, Brandon. We're more than a month into the 2022 session. So wanted to check in on some of the key pieces of legislation making their way through the House and Senate. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Joe. So COVID continues to be an issue in the state. Uh, one of the first things the House did was to effectively block private companies from enforcing COVID-19 mandates. Yeah, we, we, we heard in, in public testimony on this bill a lot from Hoosiers who say they were facing getting fired because they didn't want to get this shot. It's interesting to note that a lot of the people we heard from are healthcare workers, and after a recent U.S. Supreme Court decision, this bill would likely no longer help them because federal rules take precedent. But we, we heard from those workers, and Republicans in the House are responding to saying no one should have to lose their job because they won't get this shot. Now, Every major employer organization in the state, including the Chamber of Commerce, the Manufacturers Association, the Restaurant and Hotel Lobby, they're all opposed. Every healthcare organization, every major healthcare organization in the state, they're all opposed. And both in committee and on the floor of the House in debate over this bill, we heard from Republicans a lot of anti-science, anti-vaccine misinformation. But Republican Representative Matt Lehman, who's the author of the bill, say, says it's not aimed at that sort of audience. This isn't about the effectiveness of the vaccine or the ineffectiveness of the vaccine. This is about the right of the individual in their employee, as an employee, what their rights are. So, Brandon, the House approved a tax cut package that will eventually cost the state $1 billion a year in revenue. What's in the bill? Why are Democrats opposed? You know, first, it's not just Democrats uh, who are opposed at this point um, on the bill, but what's in it is a, a range of tax cuts, mostly aimed at businesses on a variety of levels, but also uh, there are some utility tax cuts that, that ratepayers see on their bills that rate uh, so that the average user would no longer have to pay. Uh, there are also, they would also include a cut to the individual income tax rate that by the time it fully takes effect, which would take a few years, it would mean about $128 less in taxes per year for the median household income in Indiana, which is about $56,000. But yes, it would eventually cost the state uh, the range of tax cuts more than a billion dollars a year. Now, Republicans like that because they say Indiana's got billions and billions of dollars surplus, uh, record re levels of, of revenue and surplus every year. We can afford to send some back to taxpayers. But Democrats say that's a lot of money you could be spending on programs to help child care and student debt and health care costs and a million other things. But we also have some Republicans in the Senate and the governor's office who say we're not opposed to tax cuts, but we should wait a year until next session when we write a new state budget to take a full look at the economic picture to get a better sense of what our revenues are going to be in the future and then make a call. 
The House has approved a controversial school content and curriculum bill. It provides some guidelines on what can be taught and how. Can you tell us a little bit about that bill, what it does, what it doesn't do? So one of the things it tries to do is empower parents to take more of an active role in what their, uh, their kids are learning. So it would create uh, parent-led curriculum advisory committees that would work with school boards. Uh, it would require teachers to post their lesson plans and materials online. Uh, and I want to read this one because I want to get it right. The most controversial part of the bill is, as you said, it would address content. It says, one of the main features of the bill is that it would prohibit the promotion of eight different concepts focused on sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, national origin, or political affiliation from discrimination based on those traits to student feelings about their own identity and past actions of people who might share some aspect of their identity. That's the part that's been a real sticking point. Um, we also hear from, from people who were opposed to the bill like Democratic Representative Carolyn Jackson who just say, we've already been putting too much on teachers the last few years as it is. Okay, Brandon, we got to go. Thanks so much for your coverage and looking forward to more as the session continues. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Civic leaders are trying to find new ways to lure employees by improving the quality of life in their communities. And Bloomington is now allowing residents to propose traffic calming devices and making them easier to be implemented. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Public media's role now is more than ever to get the facts out, to be as transparent as possible, and to tell the truth as we know it. There's a lot of information out there, and it's really hard to know what you can believe, which is why I think people turn to us again and again. It's public media's role to try to help educate and enlighten. PBS continues to be one of the most trusted ah, institutions in the country. We really do go out and meet Live. the moment as it's happening. We are there at the front lines asking tough questions and getting important and robust answers. We're playing a major role in combating lies, fake news. As journalists, we are trying Trying to bring the most fair coverage that we possibly can. It's about digging deeper and talking to the powerful and especially to the powerless. Public media is the place where you cut through all the noise. We move forward by staying true to our values. And on PBS, news is human. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The pandemic forced a large percentage of the population into remote work, which experts expect to persist even after COVID-19 subsides. As Brock Turner reports, many cities are doubling down on quality of place investments to attract remote workers, but their limited budgets could be stunting growth. Sullivan, Indiana's town square looks like so many others. Law offices, restaurants, and stores surround the courthouse. But behind these modest marquees is a transition largely out of public view. Sullivan and dozens of other Indiana cities have subtly shifted the way they think about economic development and attracting new residents. It started years ago, and like so many other things, the pandemic has only accelerated it. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to reinvest in our community increase the quality of life, and statistics are telling us right here in the city of Solomon that while we might have declined in population over the decade from 2010 to 2020, we've actually gained population every single year, 2017, 2018, 2019, 20 and 21. In a place like Sullivan, stopping the bleeding is significant. The city is in transition as one of its largest employers, a coal plant, is set to close next year. Instead of throwing money and incentives at another large employer, Lamb is hoping to reduce blight and invest in projects that improve the quality of place. What you hear in a lot of communities, and I'm sure I can speak for a lot of mayors, is Somebody needs to come in and do something with that building. Somebody needs to come in and invest and give me a job. Since assuming office 10 years ago, Lamb has created a civic center and encouraged businesses to relocate to the town square. He's hoping to lure residents here to the square and recreate a central business district that's connected to other amenities. An aquatic center and trails are currently under construction a stone's throw away. The political ideology it never lines up exactly. Uh, you know, we don't like leeches, we don't want handouts, but by golly, we want somebody else to come in here and invest. Ball State economics professor Michael Hicks says that is exactly the right approach, especially post-COVID. 
Sullivan doesn't need to be like Carmel, doesn't need to be like Manhattan. If you wanted to live in Manhattan, you're not going to move to Sullivan. But there are a lot of Americans, a, an abundant number of Americans who want to live in a clean, safe place with decent schools where they can know their neighbors. Indiana ought to be thriving on that. But that's at odds with the approach some state lawmakers are taking. The General Assembly has largely focused on cutting taxes in hopes of attracting those big fish employers. Indiana has one of the lowest tax rates in the country, and legislation being debated right now at the Indiana State House would cut taxes even more. That's while the state anticipates its surplus exceeding $5.1 billion by the end of the fiscal year. Lower business tax rates mean governments have less money to work with. At the same time, other quality of life metrics are suffering. Fewer than 50 percent of college students graduate on time, and data shows Indiana ranks 39th in the nation per K-12 funding per student. Late last year, Indiana funneled a large share of federal dollars to local community development projects through its Ready Grant program. said one of our number one things we need to focus on is population scarcity and how do we attract more talent to the state of Indiana. Right. Our Ready approvals are complete. I would project right now that there are there's another 500 million ready to go. If we would have had 800 million, we could have funded 800 million of quality projects right now throughout the state of Indiana. Most economic policy experts see a fine line between creating an environment that attracts both workers and businesses while providing resources to retain them. We need more talent, more people in the state of Indiana to attract more business. Low taxes can be good for attracting businesses to an area, but lower taxes can limit the amount of money local governments have to invest in quality of place and education, which are key to attracting and retaining outside investment. While Lamb appreciates state partnerships that have created unique spaces here, he and other mayors always wish there were more. Grants are great, but you have to have something to count on every single year. So you can continue to invest in your community, you can continue to uptick your population, and then it all takes care of itself. That's why Hicks says state officials should take notice before it's too late. For Indiana to be successful, we can't just have one big growing metro area, that's Indianapolis. We have to have dozens and dozens of cities around the state that are like Fishers, like Shelbyville, like Sullivan that are growing, and that is gonna take the, some local fiscal flexibility that we just don't have in our system right now. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Now, Greller and other experts say state tax cuts affect individual communities in vastly different ways because each has a different mix of businesses, housing developments, and manufacturing. Now, while that debate continues, work is already being done in a number of communities through the state's Regional Economic Acceleration and Development Initiative, which awarded $500 million to 17 regions around the state. We're joined now by Tina Peterson, the president and CEO of Regional Opportunity Initiatives, Inc. They and their their partners helped secure $30 million in ready grants for the Uplands region. Welcome, Tina. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, Joe. Thank you very much. So let's just start. Tell us a little bit about the ready program and what the state is really hoping to accomplish by this. Yeah, absolutely. You know, listening to the governor, of course, he's um, very focused on population growth. And so first and foremost, this was identified as an opportunity for this region really to grow the population we need to support uh, the level of economic development that I think the state believes is necessary. So Ready in and of itself was meant to address population growth, um, to focus on talent, on quality of place, on innovation and entrepreneurship really as those key elements of economic growth in our community. I think the governor has stated that, you know, he really wants to lead the nation in regional collaboration. Um, and so I think that focus on regionalism was very deliberate on his part. So your group led the proposal for the Uplands region that includes mm -hmm. Monroe and 10 surrounding counties. How did that proposal come together? How do you get 10 counties c talking together? Well, we're very fortunate, right, in this region. The Indiana Uplands is a region that was formed, um, gosh, in 2015 out of a grant that we received from the Lilly Endowment, you know, a similar type of investment, $42 million, that's seen these 10, 11, 11 counties working together very deliberately during that time period. But I 
don't want to kid you, getting all those voices um, heard last summer, right? They announced it in May. We had till June to decide what our region was, which we already knew. And then we had two months to put together uh, what for us was a $115 million proposal uh, to the state, hoping that we would receive 50 and thrilled that we received 30. So, we so just, I'd say we analyzed, we engaged, we, we looked at our numbers, we looked at where we really have great strength in the region, especially around our key sectors that bring us that opportunity for prosperity. We did a SWOT analysis and we wrote a plan. Tina, we just have 30 seconds. Where does some mm -hmm. of that money go? We don't know exactly yet, right? The state has decided that the source of funding for this is ARPA. The funding will be available later in the year. It will have to align with the uh, requirements of the, the federal rescue plan money. So we'll be working on that strategy. All right, Tina, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Bloomington is accepting applications this month for resident-led traffic calming projects. The city is dedicating another $50,000 to the initiative. Holden Absher reports. Traffic calming devices can be controversial in Bloomington. Opinions vary, whether it's the serpentine curves on West 3rd Street, neighborhood speed bumps, or recently painted back in parking spaces near the police station. The city's bicycle and pedestrian coordinator says the goal of these projects is to improve public safety by reducing illegal speeding. Not only does it increase the severity of crashes, but it also increases the likelihood that there will be crashes. Projects on busy streets often are initiated by city staff. However, residents can request small-scale projects such as speed bumps on neighborhood streets. Before filling out an application, residents must collect signatures from at least 30 percent of affected housing units. Last year, the process required a majority of neighborhood residents to approve the project, but Rick Bile says this threshold was too high. Illegal speeding, it is illegal. Like, this is, this is a behavior that um, it shouldn't put the burden of popularity on something that we know will reduce the likelihood of harm. After reviewing applications, city staff compile data for each area. They look at speed and crash reports, as well as how many children, elderly, disabled, and poor people live in an area. Each project is then scored and ranked, and the staff moves forward with the top scoring project. It's not going to be something where, um, where one neighborhood can get more signatures than another. Um, it is it is very much based on the rubric. But Robert Deppert, who lives at the top of a hill on Countryside Road, doubts the wisdom of most traffic calming solutions. But all I can think is you're putting a cement barrier in the middle of a road uh, to hopefully slow people down. But what people are going to do is end up running into it. Three summers ago, a 16-year-old driver came speeding over his hill, lost control of his car, and damaged two cars in Deppert's driveway. I don't think he would have lost control of his car had that speed bump not been there, right kind of over a hill. But city staff knows not everybody enjoys new traffic calming devices around town, despite improved pedestrian safety. I have no delusions that traffic calming is popular with everyone. Um, you know, there is, there is evidence, there is significant evidence that traffic calming devices are the most effective and most cost efficient way to reduce speeds. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Holden Apsher. City staff uses the high priority network in the Bloomington transportation plan to decide where to install larger projects such as curb extensions and changes to street parking. For children whose stuffed animals have been injured, the Stuffy Repair Clinic at the Monroe County Humane Association can patch them up. Benta Boutier has this report. There you see your babies. Here's Spot. Like I said, I couldn't reattach this. Veterinarian technician Colleen Seal says the repair clinic is meant to teach children to maintain a love of animals. Really, we want to foster love and empathy for animals from a young age. Seal says the children she's seen since the clinic opened in December care just as much about their stuffed animals as they do about their real pets. They're well loved <laughs> for a long time. Yeah. But I like that they're not just throwing them away, you know, that they're fixing them. Some patients just need to be restuffed and stitched, while others need an eye replaced or more extensive treatment. 
Seal says most of the damage comes from family pets. Libby, our puppy. That's six-year-old Ellie Buchanan. She was at the clinic with her mother, Melissa, to pick up two discharged patients, Ballerina Bunny and a cheetah named Spot. Melissa Buchanan says they've had Ballerina Bunny since Ellie was a baby. So it's been kind of her first stuffy that she really hung on to and slept with and um, was connected to. And so we were pretty sad when Ballerina Bunny was injured. Seal says the most rewarding part of the process is the joy she sees in children who are reunited with their stuffed animals. Thank you. She did. You're welcome. And they just spring to life when they come in and they get their animal back. I realize they're just apprehensive. It's just like if we are dropping off a pet for surgery. Though the clinic has mostly had children patients, Seal says she has an appointment in a few weeks with an 83-year-old woman whose stuffed lion is missing an eye. The stuffed animal was a gift from her late husband. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Taboutier. The Stuffy Repair Clinic has appointments available Tuesday afternoons at MonroeHumane.org there is a $20 donation fee. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members.